Well, good morning, Church One. It's great to be with you again this morning. Um, as we open up God's Word, why don't you join me and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this chance once again to consider your Word, to open up our hearts. I pray that you would, in fact, open our hearts this morning, that as we um, draw near to you, you would draw near to us, and that we would all uh, have our faith and love increased by our time together. In your name. Amen. There's kind of a modern phenomenon uh, called the rise of the nuns, and by nuns we're not talking about uh, Catholic uh, women called clergy or anything. We're we're talking about uh, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. Uh, Nuns are people who, when asked their religious preference, say none. Um, According to one study I heard this week, in the 1970s, when people were asked for their religious preference, the non-respondents was about 3%. Today, that number is at 26%, and uh, if you poll people under 30, the number is 40% would say they have no religious preference. Those are big changes in just 50 years' time, and there's many reasons for that, disillusionment with organized religion, with the church, doubts, pace of life, all sorts of things play into it. But according to Charles Taylor in his massive book, A Secular Age, uh, which I've read parts of, I'm not gonna lie to you and say I've read the whole thing, that a lot of this kind of movement towards no religious preference is driven by a certain feeling that's just sort of in the air, a certain way that we modern people experience life and God. And the feeling is basically this, more and more people are convinced that the good life can be had without any meaningful connection to God or some other transcendent, which just means outside of the here and now reality. We've learned to live, as Taylor argues, buffered lives. It's almost as if our lives are inside this closed circle and there's no openness of that circle at all to God and to other meaningful realities. Now this concept of a buffered life is a complex one and I'm not gonna pretend to define it completely, but I think the best way for us to think about it this morning is to think of the buffered life as a life where we live primarily in our own heads, in our own minds. And, and, And that mind kind of, like I said, takes on a sense of a closed circle and our minds cannot be penetrated by things outside of ourselves. It's not just sort of an intellectual like effort, it's sort of just how life feels to us. It feels like we're buffered and we're in our heads. I was trying to think of an example of maybe what this would look like, and um, again, it's both an experience and an idea, but um, I like to work out at the gym and I like to run on the treadmill. Don't ask me why, I know a lot of people hate the treadmill, for some reason I like it. And I have this app called the Nike Run Club, and that app uh, will allow me to listen to Spotify, but also give me workouts while I'm on the treadmill. It'll raise my incline, it'll increase my speed, decrease my speed, all sorts of different things. And so I'll often be there uh, running to nowhere in the same place in my own world with music and instructions coming to me and I've got these little things in my ears and everyone around me has no idea. And I'm just, I'm in this crowded space but I'm in my own space. The other day a, a friend of mine saw me and came up and was trying to talk to me and I, he didn't know I had my AirPods in and he's talking to me and I'm just like, I, I couldn't stop the treadmill or my Spotify or all the, I just I had to wave them off and say, I, I can't, you know, I can't connect with you. I'm in my, my buffered space. I'm sort of encased in all this stuff and I'm, I'm sitting here running in place like in my own world. And that's just a, a picture, right? I know it's much broader than that, but, but that's in a sense what the buffered self feels like. You're just sort of in your own mind and you're, you may be surrounded by other things, but you're sort of disconnected because you're in your own place. And it makes us feel insulated and I think it can bleed over into our sense of needing God because in that own buffered space, we don't think we need anything outside of our circle, especially God, to figure life out. And this experience, right, and this way that reality feels to us, I think is part of what, not again all of it, but part of what has created this phenomenon of the nuns. You know, people that don't feel like 
they have a religious label. They don't feel like they need one. You know, they're kind of like, hey, my thoughts are my thoughts. I'm not accountable or open to a spiritual reality beyond what I think is there. You know, for a lot of people, and I talk to a lot of people, and sort of their optimal kind of test of whether spirituality is a good thing or not is basically this phrase, as long as it works for you. That's, that's it. As long as it works for you, what does it matter? Well, that's a very closed circle way of thinking about religion and God and all of that stuff. Now, let me say this. If you see me at the gym this week, I'll still have my AirPods in and I probably won't stop to talk to you. Not all this is bad, and for what it's worth, having boundaries can be a good thing. I'm not advocating we go back to a different time and place where we force people to believe things, and, and the, you know, and again, like I said, this concept of a buffered self is much deeper philosophically and theologically than I will delve into here. But I share that to say I think it opens up for all of us a challenge as we think about uh, modern life, uh, and that is like we can't really live in a closed circle. The human spirit requires walls, yes, but also openness to something outside of itself to really thrive and live. I think the call of the church today uh, really may be simply to poke holes in the circles that we all have created for ourselves and to break people out of kind of the stuffy closets of their own mind and open their minds and their hearts to a bigger reality. That is one thing that the Psalms do really well. They break us out of ourselves and open us to a bigger world, a God-created world for us to live in and move and find ourselves in. Very often the Psalms do this by getting us in touch with feelings that are signs that we are longing to connect with something so much more than we're experiencing. Two weeks ago, Sarah talked about lament, this kind of crying out to God about the hurt and the injustice and the pain that we feel in our lives. And as painful as those moments are, it is so significant to learn to lament and to talk to God about these things. Because these things uh, allow us to engage with God about our pain and, and the whole process of engaging with God, believing it or not, about our pain and our sin or the hurt that we're feeling, in a way opens us up to God. I just met with someone uh, today and he was lamenting about a battle with depression that he's having and and yet he was also recognizing that as he seeks good medical care and as he seeks good therapy, but he also realizes that in some ways talking to God about his depression has opened him up in deeper ways to the reality of God. Last week, Laurie talked about Psalm 23 and the feeling of trust that the great shepherd is there for us to remind us that we are not alone, that it is not all up to us. Our feeling of dependence and need, right, can often break us out of this bubble and open our hearts to God. This week, we're gonna be in Psalm 148, and it's gonna talk about another feeling that I think opens our hearts up to God, and it is the experience of praise. There are 150 psalms in the Psalter in the Bible. Um, The last five, Psalms 145 to 150, all end with this call to praise. It's called the doxology of the psalms. Psalm 148 is right in the middle of these last five, and it's a short little psalm, and it continually gets right to the point. It continues to admonish us to praise the Lord, Praise the Lord. By my count, 12 times in these 14 verses, we are admonished and encouraged to pray. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to talk just briefly about what I see as three ways that this call to praise can break little holes in our bubble and open our hearts to God. Psalm 148, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. 
He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. You get it? You hear it? Praise, praise, praise. The psalmist called to praise, I think I'm gonna briefly talk about three things that I believe help break holes in our little safe circles and draw us closer to God. First, the psalmist called to praise helps us to think and see things differently. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these kind of little exercises where we can see the same things but see them differently. There's that famous um, picture of a duck or a rabbit, you know, and if you look at it, uh, some people see a duck and other people see a rabbit. Uh, as you reflect on it, you know, the challenge is to get you to see what do you see, you know? If you, if you see the duck, you usually don't see the rabbit. If you see the rabbit, you usually don't see the duck. But when some, someone shows you the other, you know, you see it completely differently. By the way, this really doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, but there's this Gary Larson cartoon that's kind of a riff on this thing, and it, it, uh, it, it basically has these two medieval armies with the duck and the rabbit flags, right? And, and they're both the exact same picture, and the flags are sort of symbolizing the exact same thing, but the caption says, there can be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and embrace our duck god. I think that's funny, but in this psalm, right, the psalmist is, is seeing all of the world. He's seeing all the created order, the wind, the hail, the snow, the, the heavens above, the deeps, the, the birds in the air, the creeping things on the ground, princes and babies, kings and old people, everything he's seeing. And he's admonishing them to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Why? Like, why are all things to praise the Lord? because the Lord has made them, he says, and they all reflect his glorious name. For, for the psalmist, you know, praise is a way of seeing. He sees all things as sort of built and made to reflect the glory of God and to communicate the glory of God. It really is a matter of seeing. When you look at the world, do you see a created order that reflects a glorious creator? It really can impact the way that you see things. In John Paul II's Theology of the Body, one of, the, one of his key insights in, into sexuality is that sexuality is not just something that happens between two bodies, but between persons. And persons bear a mark and, and are more than bodies. A person is both a body and a soul. And John Paul II urges us as, as we see ourselves as sexual beings to see us as persons, not simply bodies. What an amazing insight that gives to us in areas of like lust and pornography. What a, what a profoundly different way to see something like sexuality. It is so that it can really be a matter of praise. Sexuality and gender reflect the created order of God. The psalmist looks at that, and that's one small example of like when you see the world, do you see it in a reductionist way? Do you reduce it to something, or do you see something so much bigger? The psalmist calls us to praise God by seeing the world itself, the created order, as speaking forth the fact that it is made and designed by a God with intent and love and purpose and design. And in its very nature, it speaks forth creation. I remember Ann telling me the story of going to the zoo. I talked a few weeks back about C.S. Lewis and the zoo, and she was sort of there just um, kind of grinding through those little kid days, and she had Molly and Michael pushing them alone around a cart at the zoo, and she saw these giraffes, and these giraffes just started running, 
And there was something about these giraffes and their bodies and their long necks and watching them move so quickly. And, and there was something about it that just lifted her heart. And it was almost like as these giraffes were running, they were praising God by the way they were running. That is such an amazing way to see the world. And it sort of lifted Anne's spirits as she was just sitting there at the zoo. So the first thing the psalmist says is see the world differently. Secondly, praise helps us to bring proper value. To praise something, right, is to, to give it value. That's literally what it means. We still have the, the term today, house appraisers, right? What does a house appraiser do? He comes to your house and he appraises it. He sets the value. He says, this is, this is the proper value at which this house can be mortgaged or, or a loan can be made to it. The whole point of a house appraiser is to set the right value. So to praise something, right, you can almost hear the word price in praise, right? To praise something is to, to put a price on it. One of the things that we're learning uh, in these days of inflation is that prices really do matter because prices set the value of things. Roughly speaking, inflation happens when there's too much money in the system and that excess money artificially raises the, sum, raises the price of something beyond what its value really is. And when, when that be, begins to happen, things get all out of whack. When prices are artificially high, above the real value of something, things are out of whack. Can I get an amen to that, right? We experience that. Psalm 148 again and again calls us to place a value not on the created things, but on the God that has actually made the thing. It says all of creation is to praise God because God alone, his name is great and worthy of all praise. We get in so much trouble, right? When we ascribe too much value to things that are really not meant to hold it. God alone is what the one to be praised. God alone is the one who holds you. God is the one who gives you a name. God is the one who made you and has an everlasting future for you. God is your redeemer. Even when God, you've abandoned him, God did not abandon you. That is where your praise must sit and rest, not on the created things of the world, but on the things that God has done. Give God the value he deserves and the other things fall in line. Lastly, Psalm 148 calls us to join the song. Go back and read, all of creation is already singing praises to God. It, I, I love this image of the birds and the creepy crawly things, the, the, the monsters of the deep sea and the, the mountains and the fruit trees and the cedar trees. In a sense, the psalmist is saying, those things are continually singing praises to God. Even things like kings and princes and the different seasons of our lives to, at different stages of our lives, even those things, the order of life, the human order of life, in its sense is singing praises to God because it's speaking of an order and a design and it's lifting up the name of God. It's singing a song. It's kind of a cool thought to ponder that all of the universe is constantly singing a song of praise to God. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, if these are fictional books, right, about this world called Narnia, Several people from our world are transported into Narnia and they're able to witness the creation of Narnia. And this creation comes through a song. Let me read you an excerpt from the book, The Magician's Nephew. Again, these are people from our world witnessing this creation that comes. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. 
They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness. Next moment, a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out. If you had seen it and heard it, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing and that, that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. I love this image. There is a song of praise being sung all the time deeply in this universe because God spoke this universe into existence and God's speech is a song. The psalmist is saying that the, the, the world is singing praises to God and you and I are invited to join that song. This past Monday night, I went to the Capitals game. My daughter Molly took me as a birthday present. And I'm a big Caps fan, as I mentioned to you. And I, but I watch most of the Capitals hockey games alone on TV. Usually my only uh, human interaction, because uh, Ann doesn't really like the games that much, is uh, text of frustration from my friend Mike Pate, who's still mad at the Caps that they fired Barry Trotz years ago. But other than that, my experience of watching the Caps is just me in my little bubble in my living room, watching it on a screen. So to be there in person on Monday night in a packed arena uh, in a playoff game with all the energy that goes into that was such a, a powerful thing, such a different experience than me in my bubble. In the first period, the Caps were on a pl power play and my main man, TJ Oshie, scored on a deflection the Caps were suddenly up one to nothing and the place erupted. 15,000 people, I'm guessing. I don't even know how many people were there. Um, but everyone cheering and erupting. And I, I didn't know this before, but I guess when TJ Oshie scores at home, they play the John Denver song, Country Roads. And so there I am in the midst of this huge crowd and two TJ Oshies skating along the bench, getting high fives, 15,000 people singing as loud as they can, country roads, take me home to the place I belong. And there I am invited to join into this song. I mean, I gotta tell you, I mean, it was such a different experience than my buffered little self at home watching my TV. We're invited to join the song that all of creation is singing. It is a song of praise written into it by the creator himself. What a joy to be invited to sing. But for most of us, this invitation to sing is a threatening thing, right? As Tim Keller puts it, we know that when we sing, we sing out of tune. Our sin, our personal sin, has knocked us out of the tune with the song of creation. And I think that points us to the end of the psalm. Because this psalm goes from this massive view of all creation singing the song to this image of a single horn and God's chosen covenant people. In verse 14, it says, God raised up for his people a horn. Now, what do they mean by a horn? Well, I think this is what they mean that a horn is a sign of strength. Think of like a ram with like big horns on it. It's a sign of strength and pr protection. It's a sign of rescue and, and, and guidance. Tim Keller argues that this horn is an allusion to Jesus, who is our great strength, our deliverer, our rescue. And when by God's grace, the horn of salvation that's been raised up for us gets into our hearts, and we realize that our sin has been forgiven, we get to sing again a beautiful song of redemption, of being saved by Jesus from our sins. When our sin made us out of tune, Jesus enables us to sing a song of grace alongside this great chorus of creation. We are invited to sing. We're invited to see the world differently and we're asked to give proper weight to where it belongs. All of these that are wrapped into this invitation of praise can break us out of the simple bubbles that we're in and open our hearts to a greater reality that brings with it life and joy and peace in a way that you couldn't find anywhere else. 
You see, we are not meant to be stuffed inside our own impenetrable circles. As the psalm reminds us, we may feel safe in there, but we must break some holes in those circles. The psalms that we've been focusing on these last three weeks show us ways that that happens. Whether it's through lament or trust or praise, we break free from ourselves and we're invited into the great song of the universe. As we wrap up our time this morning, I ask you to reflect on a few things. Where is God inviting you to sing right now? What in your world is worthy of praise? Can you express that praise to God? Where might your song have gotten a little out of tune? Maybe you're singing about other things or trying to praise the wrong things or maybe feeling unworthy of singing. Can you allow God's grace the grace that comes through our horn of salvation, Jesus Christ, to bring you back into harmony with him. Will you join everyone in this great song of praise? You're invited into it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may you indeed um, give us the strength to praise you break into our hearts and help us sing this great song of praise that all of creation is singing. We want to praise you, Lord. We don't want to stay stuffed in our little circles. Help us break free through songs of praise. Amen. I thought it would end our time uh, with the doxology. Um, I'm not sure of this, but um, the doxology is a song that's been sung for centuries within the church, but it seems to me as I looked at the lyrics of the song uh, that they are inspired by Psalm 148, and so I thought I'd end our time with the doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God bless you, Church One. Have a great day.